All right, how's it going? Thank you for bearing with me. Jesus. No worries, dude. What's up? <laughs> Man, thank you so much for taking the time, first and foremost, today. Uh, I don't, for whatever reason, I was trying to go live and it was telling me that there was a buffering issue and that, uh, so I just turned off the Wi Fi connection and uh, I think it's working now. So thanks for bearing with me for a second there. Hell yeah. So very cool. You guys are currently on the road right now, right? Um, kind of. We just got back from uh, our longest tour we've ever done. It was about 50 dates. Um, we're about to go on the road after uh, February 7th. We leave uh, for Europe. So we're going on a Damn. tour with Tom Death, uh, Drop Dead, and uh, Siberian Meat Grinder. <laughs> so sick. I mean, and and uh, uh, the, the acts as well, you know, also very cool to be able to go over to Europe. But then uh, being in like in great company, I feel like is always a, is always a plus, you know, is always, you know, a good time for going on the road. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there are inspirations. Uh, both Napalm Death and Drop Dead so are honored to. <laughs> totally, totally. Now, as far as your interests, uh, you know, just kind of going back a little bit and, and you know, digging into uh, where, you know, musical interests really started for you personally, as far as possibly, you know, parents listening to different things or anybody uh, introducing you, where does something come along that really, you know, uh, uh, grabbed your ear and, uh, and had you start, you know, paying more attention to things? Um, I mean, I always really liked music growing up. My parents aren't musical or anything. They don't like, they don't, they're not into the arts like that, like creating them. They appreciate them, but they're not into it. Um, sure. so, I mean, I always like gravitated towards that kind of, uh, aspect of things, visual audio. And, uh, so for heavy music though, I mean, I, I got introduced to it by, you know, other kids, um, you know, we used to burn CDs and stuff for each other then. So, like, I kind of came into heavy music when, like, that sort of technology was accessible. So we were all, like, making CDs for each other. And I heard Converge I'm from Massachusetts. So, like, Converge has always been really, really big in our lives here. So that was yeah. like, the first heavy band that... Oh, and you're wearing a Converge shirt, too, aren't you? I, yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, very, uh, very convenient, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, uh, that's where so, I that's where I got hooked basically with that band. Uh, there was another band, uh, and I don't even know how this got to me or who gave me this, uh, but it was like right when they started out to that band. It was like a scramsy band called Circle Takes the Square. Oh, I don't know why. Shit, yeah, that was like another band that like I gravitated towards really early, even though like they weren't. It was like a very obscure choice for the time, so I'm not really yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I dug that. They were they were Massachusetts. Was that like a local band around? No, no, they. Uh, oh, okay. From maybe like I don't know. I don't want to say something stupid. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure, no, not a problem. Uh, so I mean, and you know, you bringing that up too, especially you know with like earlier on and convergent things. Your your local. How do you get introduced to shows, seeing music live? You know, having that experience as far as that transfer. How how did how does that come to you? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm from a small city town. Uh, so it's like the very western part of Massachusetts. Our city here is Pittsfield. Um, back when I was a kid, we did have shows and stuff, and we had a few spots. Like uh, they were all DIY spots. We had like a skate indoor skating rink that would do stuff. And like since oh, it's also close up in uh, New England, like bands like Hatebreed would come out and play and shit. Like yeah. Yeah, in Pittsfield. Uh, there was like a drag of uh, a street where there was like a bunch of stores on it and there was like a thrift shop and stuff that would do it like all these rotating like VFWs are like big up here or they were for shows uh, so like I, I just kind of I was always I'm an only child and so I I really really wanted to uh, meet other kids my age that like my stuff so that's kind of where I got into shows um, course i come from like my space era so like i would go out of town for like to see the bigger cool like uh cooler bands that were playing like daughters and stuff i'm talking about like when i was oh, yeah. a major so <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the, that's that's kind of how i branched out small town though so like the shows weren't really big per se uh but the community was there and it was it's really exciting time to like be going to shows and mm -hmm. I don't know. I have I have fond memories. It wasn't the most inclusive, I'll say. Like I didn't really see a lot of bands that looked like me, or like uh, or like bands that were promoted around that were 
in the specific style that I like. So, uh, sure. but that's changing a lot now. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's, it's a rad time to see, you know, especially, um, I, I know, uh, you know, not really putting at, at forefront or highlight as far as like female fronted or anything like that, but, uh, seeing that and, and having, you know, bands that are coming around and that have been around, I mean, yourselves, you guys have been around since like 2018, 2017, right? Yeah, so we we had like a first incarnation of the band when we lived in Ithaca. It was uh, called Just Escuela, and it mm -hmm. was more as core. Uh, and then we moved out to where I'm from, so Western Mass. And uh, we have like a new iteration of the band that was like 2018. So yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> where where did the where did the change come from? I actually had that in my notes as far as uh, initially like the the first like demos, and so just being Escuela. Where did the the popping in the grind there? Yeah, uh, so <laughs> we got sued by a cover band from New York. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I can edit this out. I'm sorry. That sucks. <laughs> oh, no. I can edit it out. Fuck them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> spell their name the same. We looked up, like, on Bandcamp and stuff, like, as well uh, before to see if there was anyone that had the name, and no one did. But we didn't, like, really think to look for, like, cover, that, like, Americana no. cover I don't know. It just wasn't. But like, yeah, they, they have like money and they sued us. And uh, at the time, it was impossible for us to like fight it. They were like sending cease and desist and takedowns. They got our music off Spotify. We had to like fight to get it back. Like Bandcamp, even like Bandcamp Shit. was the only thing that didn't take our music down. They like actually opened a line of communication to say like, "Hey, does this check out?" Or so they 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 did not take our stuff down which was awesome but everything else did like like people were hitting up people that posted youtube videos of uh like just live performances stuff trying to get them taken down like it was God, it was dang. really crazy so we had to like make a quick change and our instagram was already escuela grind so we we're like fuck it just do escuela grind <laughs> okay <laughs> and i mean honestly like you know obviously a, a setback but then you know like the name like I feel like it's a it's a hard move having grind in the title. It's something that you don't see a whole whole lot. So uh, I dig that. I mean, that's sick. <laughs> Although unfortunate, but uh, yeah. So you um, you you mentioned being an only child. You had friends that were from school, or how was it that you were you were introduced to? Maybe I I missed that part as far as into heavier music, or is it just something that you saw maybe someone wearing t-shirts? Yeah, there was some of that. Um, I mean, we always had like. Uh, ways to get, get access to like concert DVDs and stuff and I mean like oh yeah you know you'd start by, by like learning Deep Purple and stuff and then like you branch out and uh, early on like the Hellfest DVDs Hellfest from yes that no more but like I would watch those like a lot um, we didn't really have like YouTube or anything so mm -hmm. like you know we would just you know see people in t-shirts when you drove over to albany and like went to the mall you'd see like this comeback kid t-shirt or something <laughs> okay What's that? Or, yeah like, that's you know. the, the new england metal and hardcore fest dvds like those yeah, were that, staple yeah those were so so sick like, yeah yeah just that kind of stuff and like i was an only child but i like basically lived at my best friend's house and both me and her we were like uh, at the time, very like, not like, like I don't know how, what the proper word is, but like kind of analytical about like music. So we would just like get on the, you know, dial up and like try and learn about bands and stuff and mm -hmm. just kind of like researching, I guess. And then like as soon as we could find like a LimeWire download or something, we would download <laughs> like it, like it, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I, I, for whatever reason, like for the longest time, my parents or, you know, like living in, in my, my parents' house, we didn't have like the internet or anything. So I was so jealous of cats that like were able to download or were able to like have like full, you know, I would go and save up a couple allowance or something to buy like a couple CDs. And then I go to my friend's house and they have terabytes of just like a computer saved with oh, yeah. everything I've ever wanted. <laughs> I'm like, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's right. So uh, where, where does coming into musically, did you, were you involved in band? Were you involved in things school wise? Like how did, uh, how did anything musically come uh, to you? 
Uh, yeah, so I went to a really small school, like it was a middle high school, and it was combined, and like our graduating class was like 55 people or something like that. So oh, like, wow. This, the school is really, really small, which meant that we had like all these band, all this band here in the band room that like, you know, there was an excess of it. We, like our school was so small, and we had good test store, scores, and in Massachusetts like that, like uh, is equivocated to like how much you get. So you get art supplies, you get band equipment. It just so mm. happens that we were the ones that got, got that. You know, we for good or the worse, it was a small school and we got a lot of band gear. So I tried to learn every instrument at least a little bit in bands. Back then I was a lot more musical, I guess, than I am now. I mm -hmm. kinda just have the vocal stuff for escuela and, you know, little things that I do there but yeah i loved learning every instrument you know marching stuff and and yeah uh, like i said me and my best friend uh we would you know, do our best to learn, learn guitar and stuff and she was way better than me but uh, <laughs> okay uh, now like before you know even taking on vocals or anything as far as like for a band how how did that get introduced to you uh now uh, was was this well your was that your first band yeah pretty much uh okay band uh always wanted to do something uh i was kind of you know in my later teen to 20s years around here like really in hardcore uh and with that i always wanted to start like a hardcore band but i just never i don't know never was asked and i'm not the type of person to be like hey i want to or at least that the type of person to be like i want to do this with you and uh okay yeah, small scenes, so, and I moved around a lot. I moved down to Texas and eventually back up here north, so I just never got the courage to uh, go ahead and take what I wanted out of uh, yeah. out of music, but uh, with Escuela, yeah, first uh, opportunity to do so, and we kind of hit the ground running, so I'm grateful. grateful. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and like, when you're initially taking on vocals, and uh, just, uh, especially for like the tone that you have, did you have different CDs or different, you know, albums that, you know, you kind of were going uh, initially as far as testing out your vocal range or how do you discover that as far as your approach? Yeah. Um, oh my goodness. Since it was like my first serious band uh, and like serious recordings, I guess you could say, uh, it was pretty daunting. There was a lot of time where it was like trying to figure out what sounds best for what I can do like what sounds best with what style of recording, what style we were writing, like it, this mm -hmm. whole thing sort of evolving. So yeah, in the beginning, like lots of hardcore, lots of like New York hardcore. Um, I've always been a really big fan of like Gnostic Current and stuff like that. So like okay. jumping off point. And then like at the time when we were starting out, it was like really fast core power violence. So I took a lot of influence from like West Coast power violence, like as buys you um which like the vocal styles are like a lot of people think they're goofy but like there's a lot of variety within them like there's band sure. lack of interest and stuff that sound ridiculous maybe to like the first time you hear them but it sounds totally different than a different power violence band with like equally as goofy vocals you know what i mean yeah. so <laughs> some of that and like and and try it out and there's been times where we do more or less of that. On this last album, I went pretty straightforward and uh, I've uh, learned a lot about how to do vocals sort of correctly. I'm not perfect. I am still struggling with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in just terms of like, do you feel like getting down breathing or what are, you know, like, what are some things that you still feel? And I only asked just out of uh, not like a vulnerability standpoint, but somebody who is learning these things and taking on, you know, like uh, trying to do to to do vocals. I guess okay. So here, like my tips, I guess you, I would, I would package this as like you have a PA system. Like maybe when you're starting out and stuff, and in even like bands in our position, we play DIY venues all the time. You're not always gonna have a monitor. I get that. You're not always gonna be able to hear. But like trust the amplification like you do not need to strain your voice going any louder a lot of the time because that, that's what the microphone is there for that is what mm. the system is there for. so like i get it not 
every time it's going to be uh, easy for you to hear and, and have confidence in that people can hear you. But uh, that's mm-hmm. important. And especially, oh, okay. like, start touring for, like, more than a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, 50 dates, like we just did. Like, you really mm-hmm. have to pace yourself, stretch it out. So that's one good way to do it. Um, okay. Like, learning in general, breathing is so important. There's a lot of different ways you can scream and not hurt yourself. Uh, but breathing is at the base of those. So I've always had issues, like, with my I don't have asthma or anything. So I can't give advice about that. But, like, I have really shallow breath. Uh, I know you're supposed to use the diaphragm, but I struggle with that. So recently I got this. There's a kind of a DIY. You can do this exercise, but I bought a little machine to help me do that it's not a machine it's like a looks like an inhaler but it has like a little ball inside and you like breathe in and out of it, it strengthens your uh lung capacity basically and your diaphragm oh okay capacity. so uh like the, the diy way you can do that is that you get a glass of water and a straw uh you can look that up on google how to do that but like if you like do vocal warm-ups into the water with the straw that also like does the similar effect it just creates huh. there so that you can oh wow. <laughs> uh, uh, Little things like that, and then warming up. Warming up is also really important, whether you want to do that uh, with aggressive vocals or even clean vocals, just getting your voice going, just like stretching. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's great. There's there, certainly touching on you know, uh, just being a fan and being out in the, the crowd or you know, being in front of a band that's playing and and uh, you know, all the sound coming out. It always amazes me when I can hear the vocalist over the actual PA, like, man, <laughs> this this guy or this gal uh, probably has a lot more dates after this, and this sounds like it, it hurts. <laughs> so that's, uh, I mean, and you you mentioning trusting, you know, the, the, the equipment, and almost as if the guitarist has a guitar, drums and drums, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that being something that's, that's helping along. I know that there was kind of a stigma for a little time, you know, where uh, having the vocals up, you know, ultra high, people were kind of, you know, silly on that. But uh, I, I know just even from interviewing vocal coaches and Melissa Cross and uh, uh, different people, you know, it's like, man, there's, it, it's just, it's not necessary. So I love hearing that. And that's a, I mean, that's a great tip for anybody taking it yeah, on. Absolutely. And if, if the audience can't hear, they're going to let you know, like they're always, yeah. like, especially at extreme music shows, they're going to be like, turn the vocals up. Like they're going to yell yeah. high for you. So like, yeah. <laughs> almost, yeah. Um, yeah, no, they'll let you know if they, if something's off, they're there, they're there, they're there, you know. <laughs> so what goes into, you touched on a little bit of this, but as far as, you know, uh, prepping yourself for, for going out for a show, uh, maybe from earlier on, even through to today, as far as anything that maybe centers yourself, uh, just helps you get uh, mentally prepared for, for taking on a show. Yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a lot of aspects to that. But so mentally, if we're talking about just mentally, mm-hmm. like when we first started out, like I was quite, right. Like I and I still have stage fright all the time, but I, I, I've evolved my thing. So when we first started out, like, I would literally have to, like, go to the bathroom and, like, look at myself in the mirror and be like, you can do this. Like, you're cooler than David Aww. Bowie. Like, you shit like that. You know, like, <laughs> yourself up, gas yourself up, whatever you got to do, and then get out there and act the part, if you will. Um, and then sort of that faded away. It didn't need to be a part anymore. I could, like, bring some of my actual self out into it so that was the first evolution and mm-hmm. then now you know like i do proper warm-ups and stuff when i can and uh and that stage fright has only been i use it as like a tool to kind of like channel that adrenaline into like all out performance because I, I move around a lot like i'm jumping and i'm not always perfect with my vocals but i prefer <laughs> to be in motion rather than standing still and having to be right. perfect that's just me. Um, so yeah, I've taken like that anxiety, that um, stage fright. I just, just like mentally switch it to like adrenaline, and it helps with the performance. And, like kind of activating like a fight or flight mechanism. It's not that serious, but like that keeps you going in a lot of ways because sometimes you know doing cardio for 25 minutes like I do that <laughs> when I'm not singing or on tour but like it's very difficult for me so sometimes I'm like how am I even <laughs> this it's kind of silly it's not that long of time but sure 
yeah so so evolving allow yourself to evolve you know like i get it it's it's difficult when you start and like sometimes you need to adopt that persona mm -hmm. that you're trying to emulate or whatever and, and if that gets you through perfect but then you've mastered that you can put yourself into that you can become that persona nice so. Awesome. I love that. I, I, I think it's always something that, you know, it, it, that I've always had my eye on. Um, as far as being a drummer, you know, there's different ways that you can stretch and different prep, you know, beforehand. But um, anybody vocally, I have always been, you know, admired by as far as just day in and day out doing these things and how to prep yourself and how to, uh, I just feel like it's a whole other game as far as uh, especially uh, the, the pronouncing or or the, the actual physical aspect of mm -hmm. singing and being on tour and whatnot. So I, I, I really appreciate hearing this stuff because it's, it's awesome. And uh, anytime I can get, you know, to dig into uh, even younger kids that are getting into these things and not having to beat the hell out of themselves. <laughs> I um, knew a lot of what I know now then just to save myself so much grief. Uh, yeah. <laughs> only experience these things, I feel. Sure. <laughs> Sure, sure. I, I appreciate that. What about your first show? So, uh, Esquela, you know, this is roughly 2017, 2018. Um, you guys have written some stuff. Tell, bring us back to your first show and, and what, what, it, what went into that? Was it, was it fun? Uh, did, it, did anything go wrong, go good? Um, so our first show, yeah. So we basically, like, I was living in New York City. I had, like, a uh, semester that I had to do there. When we started the band, we were all like uh, two out of the three of us were in school. So, you know, it's, uh, that's kind of one of the reasons why that happened. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, so I was in New York. Uh, our then guitarist and Jesse, our drummer, they were writing songs and they wrote 10 songs. And they had them good to go. And, you know, I wrote my parts to them and stuff and was practicing. And, uh, before I think even before we had music out, we played our first show. Uh, it was a basement house show in Binghamton. Uh, yeah, just your standard basement grindcore show. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can't really mention the band that we played with because they turned out to be real scummy. So, um, oh no, it happens. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was it was cool to finally be doing something musically uh, back up north in New York. I have fond memories of that. Uh, every band needs to start with a basement show, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fun. I, uh, I, I, I feel like the last show of uh, this last band that I was in here, um, at one point we're playing and I'm looking down at the floor at the set list to see what was next. And I looked up and the vocalist of my band somehow grabbed like a banister mm -hmm. and it crashed oh, no. and he was just on his back with this fucking two by four board over top of him. So yeah, basically show is rule. You never know what you're going to get though. <laughs> we played that same venue twice with that first, that we had that first show. And I can't remember if this was, this was the first show or not, but he's you know, in basement. So you have like a whole flight of stairs down to the bottom. This one punk kid was so drunk. Like he, I don't know if he like threw himself down the stairs or he fell down the stairs. <laughs> fall down an entire flight of stairs, like take like, it up and be like, yeah, I'm a rock. <laughs> oh <laughs> <Punk> moment, so. <laughs> man. I mean, and, and there's the fun in those things where sometimes you show up, uh, you know, as like an artist going to play and you just kind of wonder like, uh, I don't know how this is going to turn out. And, uh, you know, there's lots of times that, you know, if it's not a complete bust, there's, a lot of great memories to be made in uh, in basements for sure. So, <laughs> oh, that was just funny. like um, up the venue and being like, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure about this one. Like, we yeah. played uh, Fort Collins for the first time, Fort Collins, Colorado, um, okay. in September, and we pull up to the venue and it's like an outside movie theater. Basically. Like, the spot was really cool. There was like art everywhere. Like really eclectic spot but it was outside and it was rainy and cold and we were like oh i don't know how this is gonna go but like two very you know yeah it's gonna be great like we got a lot of and then like to see the whole space like flood out with kids like like i think like 150 kids or something came to like oh shit we're in fort collins outside in the rain like and cold like it was so 
crazy. Like, like you said, when it works out, it really does work out. So yeah, that rocks. Did you say it was the, the, the audio cut for a second? It was the outside movie theater? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it was. It was a Whoa. Venue. It's that rips. It's called The Lyric in Fort Collins. They're really awesome. It's an indie movie theater. They got like a little local artisan gift shop, like a bar and food and Dang. And, uh, oh yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> oh okay. Um, now as far as you guys' first uh, non-servium, mm -hmm. there, there's, there's the credit as far as the art and the layout to you. What you know, what went into that? As far as did you was that anything in school that you went for, or uh, graphic design? Was that something? Kind, of, kind of. I, 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 I um, yeah, yes and no. Like I did go to school for art. Uh, like sculpture and art history double major when I was in undergrad. Um, that has nothing Sick. to do with what I was doing. I just like doodle. Okay. Yeah, I do art occasionally and I do Photoshop a lot and Illustrator, but like that's not my main thing. I, I'm an architect, so I went to school for that after my my art school, school escapade and I, uh, I worked uh, for a while and I have my license and I can, I can do uh, architecture on my own. But since, uh, I think since September, I've been uh, just doing a Squilla full time. So a Squilla grind is my. Sheesh. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I was going to ask how that works as far as balancing, but uh, it's gotten to the opportunity really? where you can take it on full time. time and yeah. Wow. Shit. That's awesome. That's yeah, great. Grateful. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Now, it's crazy. We have so much going on, and we're all in the position to do that. And we're just like so, so grateful that that's a possibility for us. Like, <laughs> so sick. That rules. Now, in in 2020, you guys had the two EPs and then the full length releases as, as well. Was this right around COVID? Was was going on then? As far as being able to have time and like, let's knock some shit out. Let's let's just get some get some get some fun uh, music out there to the to everybody. Yeah, so actually all of those pieces were like basically recorded and planned before COVID. Uh, our full okay. was released the day that our state shut down um, completely. So we like just made it to the post office out all, all the like, <laughs> like you couldn't do any, anything. So it was, a, it was wow. not a great time to release an album. Like on the one hand, it was cool because like people were home so they were listening to a lot of music then there was a lot of engagement that way but um you know it's hard to so we've always been a band that just goes out and plays shows and we've always we've always tour and that's how we've grown um and so that was that was difficult but so we did the power violence ep on that and then we had dates up until we released the full length in March, and then we couldn't do anything. And then uh, we released the Grindcore EP, I want to say May, June, um, it was hmm. at a time when the whole country was protesting. And, uh, it was difficult. It might have been late. Uh, I can't remember now because that whole year kind of blocked out. The blur. <laughs> <laughs> we just. Basically, we're like, well, we have this EP. Uh, what should we do with it? Should we wait to put it out? And should we a lot of talk about, about that? But like, we just put it out ourselves online digitally, and we took the proceeds from that, and we uh, donated them to a bunch of different causes over here. And we still do. That's so we have, like, we get sales on the EPs and stuff. That one in particular, I don't need to do like a different group that were interested. Um, awesome. So yeah, yeah, that was That's great. And, and, what, uh, what? That was a busy. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I was just like, it was like a, such a weird year because we all lived together. So that was, and we were a three piece at that time. So me and Jesse, Chrissy, our guitar player, we're all living together. So we used that year to like put out that music and then to write this album now that we have memory. So we like demo oh, okay. a million times. Demo. <laughs> yeah, geez. It was, yeah. And we were together. So we would just wake up, watch YouTube videos the band that we liked, and then write. And I, I had work at the time. But like, but mm -hmm. definitely a 
I don't think we'll have that again for a long time, that kind of focus and uh, yeah. forced productivity in that way. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it being such a weird time and such a difficult time, you know, especially for all of the hard things that happen, it's, it's almost a time too, though, to look back and, and have uh, – and an odd appreciation for it, you know, even with, you know, the opportunity that you guys yeah. had and uh, being able to, you know, all be together and writing and, uh, you know, even forced, you know, uh, among so. And uh, the one thing that I've always appreciated and I do love it in general with grindcore power violence is the, you know, the, the kind of sense of humor that you had mentioned, uh, you know, with some of the West Coast bands and things of the like. Uh, with the power violence and grindcore, the, 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 the album titles, uh, was this just something where it's like, let's just be ridiculous and have a little fun here or how did, how did those come about? I, I, I don't remember that very well. I think it was just something we, we did and it stuck and uh, it was good, goofy, but like the, the, con the like conceptualness of it was that we were going to do four EPs of our main influences and like eventually oh, okay. on like a 12 minute, but it's become the busier we get like the longer it takes to get the other two done so uh, death metal we have all the songs written we have to record them and stuff and we play them live too uh, oh and then we shit them, like, okay like that <laughs> come out. but yeah i don't know it's like you said try not to take ourselves too seriously like there is a lot of that i've put into the music i guess like lyrically and you know it's heavy music uh, mm -hmm. but there's there needs to be some levity to it i think it needs to have peaks and valleys as we like to say so, yeah physically and like emotion so <laughs> sure okay well and and you know even with i wanted to touch on lyrically um memory theater uh which just releases and is absolutely ripping uh i have had that nonstop. it's it's so sick um i had actually played in a band, I think it was at, maybe it was called the Rumbleplex in Detroit. Trumbleplex. Does that sound familiar? The Trumbleplex, yeah, there we go. Okay, so I played in a band, played with you guys, and that was where more or less I had gotten, like my eyes more focused of like, whoa, these guys rip. Like, I don't know how I haven't been keeping on top of it. So this album drops, and I, as a fan, have to say that this is like a highlight for just sound, uh, performance, absolutely sick. Um, and if you would, uh, take us back as far as the track, My Heart, My Hands. What can you tell us about the writing of that track and uh, maybe even, you know, musically and uh, vocally as well, yeah. lyrically? Um, that's a great song to start with because it's um, in a lot of, it's the second song on the album, but it like kind of builds up into the rest of the album. There is a song um, cool. Um, um, so yeah. Memory Theater, My Heart, My Hands. Uh, so the concept of the album was that, uh, like, the memory theater itself is, like, a historical, art historical concept that um, I resonate with. It's, like, back in the day before we had internet stuff, like, uh, a physical manifestation of, like, all the knowledge of the world that we take, like, think of what the internet is to us, but, like, put it in a room. And, like, you can access it through, uh, you know, it plays out before you, like, a theater or, like, a library or what have you. I'm not explaining it very well, but you can look it up historically. But anyways, I thought that, oh, it's kind of fun to think about yourself in that way. That all these <coughs> memories, all these ideas, like, we have access to every bit of knowledge that we could ever know currently, you know. <laughs> right. So, like... If our body is the impact of that, then uh, to think about you know, architectural words and whatnot, building up the memory theater, tearing it down, what's the need for this? And, and it does get personal because it is my own kind of uh, version of that. But so My Heart, My Hand specifically was the, the song that was like going to explain the building up of this, this thing and uh, this body horror, if you will. <laughs> uh, <so my> heart, <coughs> like, there's like, a lot of architectural length within it, but um, okay. like like an a, a great 
aggressively build something uh, and quick and it wants to be positive. So like my eyes, like, like if you see something needs to be built up or built specifically, like metaphorically, literally, whatever, you do everything you can to get it there and build it up quick and make it possible if there's the need for it. So, you know. Yeah. That rips. Yeah. <laughs> That's sick. That's awesome. All right. Hold so one second. <coughs> I'm like dying. Jesus H. I apologize. I'm like, no I am trying my hardest not to uh, cough it in the middle of that. Okay. So uh, I, I, I love, especially here in the whole architecture and the building process, you know, too, with you mentioning that as far as like being a career and then kind of uh, uh, transferring that into your work, having there be some, uh, metaphor, like metaphorical play with it as well. Uh, that is, that, that's rad. And I, I, from like reading back on the lyrics too, like there's different images that, that play up now too. Uh, next I wanted to touch on Strange Creature, which mm -hmm. prob probably is my favorite track on the album. Nice. I'm glad you did. Yeah, that one was, uh, so like, <clears throat> I'm like building up the, the memory theater, right? Strange Creature was like the concept of like tearing it down, like, uh, yeah. So, like, specifically in this song, like, I say, I, I've made this world my image, and I can make it be, like, I've built <laughs> okay. theater up to be my own image, and I can take it out in just an instant as, like, like this powerful, like, spiteful, not really emotion that I was going through, and I, for, I thought about Godzilla, so, like, I, <laughs> I had, like, the perspective like talking from the perspective of Godzilla and like what like being <laughs> that big like and that feel like you know like I say banishment nothing to a beast like you want to yes. I don't care I'm like too big for that like so I was trying to like take on that mindset of when you get like so pissed off if you want to just like destroy everything you create and uh yeah and the song is uh the Stampa so I like that's sick I love that. I, and especially like the, the, I don't know if you would say necessarily the chorus part, but the, the banished from land, banished from spirit, like yeah. that, so, so sick. And, and hearing that too, I mean, obviously I love horror movies. So anything to do with Godzilla, uh, no, no wonder I love it. There it is. <laughs> uh, last up, I wanted to touch on the feed. What can you tell us about that track? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> a little bit more straightforward. It was one of the later songs that we wrote. Like I had already kind of exhausted the like, okay, let's build, build it up, let's tear it down. Um, there was all is forgiven is like a personal, uh, it's very personal to me, and like I wanted to talk about like someone invading, or, like living in the very back of that space and like getting them out of there, sort of a thing. So that was like a, you know, someone entering in that space, and then like. So the feed, I wanted to kind of take a little bit of a breather from like being that concept to death. And uh, I just wrote a song about how the algorithm and social media was affecting me at the time because it was so much a part of our lives during COVID. A lot of people came to a lot of really like that you know, had realized before about what it was doing to them mentally but like it was you know once it reaches a certain audience like one of my parents like start talking about how Facebook is affecting them and they haven't grown up with it you know what I mean like, <laughs> right. about about things like not to like put her on blast or anything but my mom like my mom literally had a conversation about how like self-conscious it made and she's not the type to like talk about those things but like you know seeing her friends with like filters and stuff and she doesn't understand that it's like a filter and she's like it's so good and like i said like it's you know it's it's weird that like people our age would have to we have to teach our parents stuff sometimes <laughs> <laughs> like outside of the um the realm of that song but yeah straightforward yeah. about you know how engrossed in our lives this algorithm is and how mysterious it is um but also how simple like we know exactly what it's doing like we can we can see it like mm -hmm. you recognize it when it's happening to you at this point so so uh and yet it's so hard to give up so 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I mean, there's, there's different time. And even with <coughs> dude, what is happening? Somehow I start these things. And for whatever reason, I always forget to bring like a cough drop just in case the uh -huh. shit happens. And then I'm, I'm here I am in the middle of a conversation coughing again. Jesus H. Um, no, but I was just gonna say, even as far as uh, younger, you know, kids, youth, anybody with with social media, it's it's a hard, you know, fight to balance. Like I've found appreciation out of it, of being able to do, you know, these and myself uh, uh, being involved in bands and being able to reach out to people that I've looked up to for years. Um, I appreciate it in that sense. But then you know, somebody who's just, who just uses it and, and, you know, looks at it and almost embellishes on other people's, what they have and what they may have. Um, it's, it's a hard thing to, uh, to take. And, you know, I, I just hope for anybody that, you know, that uses those things to just have their own character and build up whatever that they can, um, you know, and, and try to try to have more fun with it and not have it be you know, so, so, so serious. Yeah. I mean, it's so personal. <clears throat> one of us that it becomes very difficult to talk about absolutes like like i mean try telling you know the parent of a kid who was so upset with themselves over what they see in social media mm. take action against themselves like the yeah, harm yeah. worse yeah like imagine yeah. telling that person like oh my life is so much better because of social media if i can have a podcast i can promote my it's democratized everything, but like my experience of it is so different from that person's experience yeah. of it. And like, yeah. and I'm not speaking absolutes about it. Like, yes, it has democratized everything, but like that's helped some people out and harmed some people because the algorithm shows people that look like this over people that look like that or bans political content either way. Like, it's, yeah. it's so, right. So, personalized and so niche that like you almost too they've created a problem that's actually grown so much that like doesn't have a simple solution yeah 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 i you know i think right right and just uh just trying to do you know what we can to to, to stay positive and to you know uh lead the best lives that we can and enjoy some live music and uh you know maybe some monster movies and <laughs> a little fun with that so um this has been absolutely awesome cat i uh, i cannot thank you enough uh i have actually reached out to other members of the band here uh, and hopefully uh you know hear some some different perspectives on uh, on the music and the work in the next few months here too so i really wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time today this has been so awesome oh, thank you so much yeah. <laughs> yeah okay all right <laughs> no no that's not a problem it's not a problem no i i yeah, i appreciate it um i'll have these this edited and then up within like the next month or so and so i'll have it on my channel and promote and uh hear more about the uh the, the lyrics and the content so thank you so much again thank you man nice to you. <laughs> absolutely you. all right have a good day bye bye He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, lo-fi horror guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.